Yeah! Mesdames et messieurs, bon matin! Comment ça va? Ah, il y en a qui ont compris, ils ont répondu bien au lieu de oui. OK, OK, on commence à comprendre la syntaxe de mes mots. OK, c'est bon, c'est bon, c'est bon. Euh, J'étais en manque de blagues ce matin, mais certainement pas en manque de textile. J'ai sorti l'artillerie lourde, question de vous rendre confus un peu sur mon apparence. Vous me trouvez beau et horrible à la fois, hein? <rire> Euh, je m'appelle Louis-Olivier Pelletier, on va se croiser au cours de la fin de semaine, vous allez voir, je vais seulement vous dire bonjour comme la première fois à chaque fois que je vous croise, ok? Vous êtes tellement beaucoup, puis je fais ah, « Allô, allô, oui, oui ». Puis je l'ai fait déjà quatre fois à toi, prends le pas personnel. Pour moi, vous êtes tous pareils, les geeks, ok? Euh, J'espère que ça a bien été hier. Euh, ce soir, euh, c'est deuxième journée, donc ça rime avec « karaoké ». Oui, 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 oui. Euh, je shotgun la voix que j'ai de Offenbach. Cette voix! Ouais, je, 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 je l'adore. Je fais une imitation très piquée des vers de Jerry Boulet. Euh, C'est Libéo qui nous organise ça. Merci beaucoup, la gang. Et euh, ils ont décidé d'appeler ça la soirée pirate. Pirate karaoké. Du jamais vu. Euh, <rire> Et sachez qu'entendre nos amis français chanter les lacs du Connemara pour une neuvième fois de suite, ça va nous faire vraiment plaisir de l'entendre. Okay? Euh, mais avant toute chose, avant les roms et les chansons, vous avez des activités aujourd'hui. Euh, si tu as fait tes preuves au euh, ping-pong cortex ce matin, tu te mérites une dose de sucre pour te récompenser. Euh, tu peux aller te régaler avec le mur de trous de beigne. L'an dernier, on avait un mur de beigne. Là, on récupère les trous de l'an dernier, puis on les a pinés sur le mur, OK? Fait que profites en sont encore bons. Um, <rire> C'est pas eux de l'an dernier, quand même. Et misère, vous croyez toutes. OK. <rire> euh, ce midi, t'as pas d'excuse pour profiter des espaces du WAC, si tu veux euh, réseauter comme tu l'entends. Euh, Jazette Desjardins, c'est le spot le plus tranquille si jamais tu veux euh, discuter en toute euh, simplicité avec quelqu'un, lumière et... Euh, Tranquillité. Hein? Quoi de mieux pour euh, discuter? Sinon, si c'est pour du café, ben, on a le café euh, .biz ici à côté. On a l'espace euh, O2 Web si jamais tu cherches de nouveaux défis ou jouer un tour à ton employeur actuel. Euh, ensuite de ça, si jamais tu n'es pas encore informé sur c'est quoi la 5G, il y a euh, la zone encore qui va tout t'expliquer ça. Et finalement, une euh, bonne main d'applaudissement, un remerciement pour notre euh, commanditaire principal qui nous offre ici ce lieu. Appelons-les par leur nom LGS, une société IBM. Wouh! Et maintenant, je cesse de parler dans deux paragraphes. Je vous présente notre, notre prochain invité. Il est euh, VP Head of Experience Strategy chez Capital One, où il est responsable de développer les aptitudes de design et infuser cette culture dans une des plus grandes firmes de services financiers du monde. Euh, de plus, il est vice-président pour l'Association mondiale du Service Design Network. Ses projets et ses idées se retrouvent d'ailleurs dans les livres « This is Service Design Thinking » and uh, « This is... » Service Design Doing, deux choses différentes. Euh, il possède une maîtrise de l'Université Carnegie Mellon. Vous ne connaissez pas ça? <rire> ben, la connaissez-vous, vous autres? Oui, ben, je ne suis pas un geek comme vous autres, je porte juste du linge qui fait croire ça. Euh, et il possède un baccalauréat en rédaction de poésie de l'Université de Pittsburgh. Euh, si vous voulez en, en savoir plus sur le design de service aujourd'hui, ça tombe bien, c'est de ça qui va nous jaser. Mesdames et messieurs, please give a big round of applause for Jamin Eggman. Bonjour, 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 bonjour. C'est bon? That's it. <laughs> Except for croissant, I can say that. Uh, hello, my name is Jamin uh, Hegeman, uh, and uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for the, the invitation. Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about service design, and as you can see, my talk is, so you want to be a service designer. Uh, hopefully, some of you uh, resonate with either wanting to be, you are, or by the end of this talk, you will want to be a service designer. Uh, But before I get into that, a little bit more about me. I believe I picked up some of the French introduction since I wrote the bio. I could kind of follow along. Uh, but uh, I'd like to describe myself in uh, five words. So one is I'm a designer. 
uh, which of course means I use Post-it notes, but I do the other more um, skilled and craft things of design as well. Uh, I studied poetry as my undergrad degree, so before I was a designer, I was a, a poet, and still am a poet. Uh, I've been playing soccer my entire life. This is the one thing I have the most experience in, 40 years playing soccer. Uh, maybe actually uh, trumped by my love of cake. Uh, I think I had cake before uh, I was five years old, so that probably is the longest running thing in my life that I've been doing, is eating cake. Uh, that is a beautiful cupcake that I got in London and have been searching for it since, uh, haven't found it again. And then I also uh, brew and enjoy a good beer. So if any of you are interested in this or have recommendations for me in Quebec, please uh, see me later and let me know where I should go to, to get the, the finest here in Quebec. Uh, I am also uh, married. Uh, my wife is uh, Carrie. Uh, here is her, her Instagram by Carrie Chan. She's a watercolor artist, uh, formerly a designer and we met at Carnegie Mellon University uh, many years ago. She's also Canadian. She grew up in Sudbury, and, um, and now her, her family lives in Toronto, and her sister is a, a resident um, radiation oncologist in Ottawa. I don't believe this video is going to play, so... <gasps> no, it's not going to play. All right, so this is the kind of watercolor art that she does, uh, because when I say watercolor artist, most people do not think of precise lines and very studied uh, color and, and graphics, but uh, if you're, you're curious, please go check her out. Uh, we also have a dog, a uh, golden doodle named Echo. You can follow him on Instagram at Echo Says Hello. He's got about... 10 times more followers than I do. <laughs> and he was recently featured on BuzzFeed. Uh, so um, check him out. He's 11 months old, almost a year. He's, he's that, so that's him as a, as a baby. And, and he sleeps upside down. It's kind of weird, but he's cool. We love him. Uh, this is the highlight of the presentation, by the way. So, <laughs> And this is not running, just FYI, the, the, the clock. All right, um, so uh, we moved recently from Dallas, Texas to New York City. Uh, I, was, um, uh, I worked for Adaptive Path before I joined Capital One, and I joined Capital One through an acquisition. So Capital One's a bank in the US, also uh, a card here in Canada. Uh, in Dallas, I was leading a team of 55 designers, uh, working on an array of uh, experiences uh, but I moved to, to Dallas to take the role of head of experience design for Capital One, and uh, what I'm looking at is how we connect experiences across the entire organization and the overall strategy for our design team. Uh, this is the terrible view from my window. And in New York, in Penn Station, there's a Tim Hortons which uh, when I went to the train station a few weeks ago, I had to take this picture to, to show my wife uh, to let her know that there's a little slice of Canada underneath the ground in New York City. All right, so this talk, So You Want to Be an Interaction Designer, was inspired for me by this uh, short article, So You Want to Be an Interaction Designer. Uh, how many of you have read or heard of this? All right. Not very many. Uh, so when I went to grad school, I studied interaction design. This is one of the, the texts that I read. It's a very short article uh, that you can Google and find on Cooper's site. Um, the date here says 2008, but I think originally it was written in the early, uh, early 2000s, maybe 2001 or 3. Uh, but what it does is it sets up um, a construct for if you are an interaction designer, uh, what do you focus on? What's your approach? And, and therefore, what are the qualities that you need to do this type of work? As I've been developing my craft as a service designer and investing a lot of time into that uh, field and practice, I started to ask myself, so what does it take to be an, a service designer? 
Where's the, the information on that? So that's what this talk is about. It's going to follow this a little bit, but uh, I'm going to talk about what it means to be a service designer. And I'm going to start with what you do. All right, so, and, and, to, and to address that, we're going to start with this question. How do you improve the patient experience at a neurosurgery clinic? Does anyone know? No? Good. Uh, there's, cause there's, no, there's no answer to this question. Um, but that was the question that was posed to us for my very first uh, full service design project that uh, I did with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in Pittsburgh. And a, a team of designers uh, teamed up with their innovation folks to look at a particular neurosurgery clinic that was experiencing uh, patient experience problems. And the reason they did is at the time, and this was more than a decade ago, there was a, a neurosurgeon that was experimenting with going in through your nose versus cutting open your head, which a lot of people preferred. And, um, and so his clinic was very popular and had a lot of people coming to him. And they had clinic day one day a week, and the rest of the day, the rest of the week, he, would, he did, did surgeries. Uh, on that one clinic day, they would get 60 to 100 people, and uh, people would have to wait up to four or five hours at times to get in to see him. But they still wanted to do this because this was a thing they wanted to get taken care of, and he was known for doing that. So to address this question, we employed uh, a you know, typical design process. I'm going to use the double diamond to, to walk through it. People familiar with the double diamond? If not, it is a model uh, of design to help, help explain uh, the, the process that you go through. It is not the way to do design. Uh, all models lie, remember that. Uh, but this was developed by the UK Design Council after studying what designers do to explain their process. So basically, they go through a discovery phase, they define what it is, what is the uh, problem that they can solve, and then they start exploring what are the solutions and then get to delivery. Often people start with the, let's just deliver and skip all the other stuff, uh, and that doesn't usually yield good results. So if we follow this process uh, through discovery, uh, one of the first things that we did was just go to the clinic itself, sit in the waiting room, uh, take pictures, observe, talk to people when we could. You can see here, it looks pretty crowded, lots of uh, wheelchairs and people holding envelopes and things. Uh, we went into the back as well. So in service design, we talk about these things as the front stage, the things that the, the people can see in the backstage. So these are the things that um, maybe you, you don't see as you're in the waiting room. But this is one of the doctors uh, looks very tired, her eyes are closed, she's leaning against the wall, waiting outside a door that she thinks uh, another doctor is in. Um, turns out he's not, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, going into the room, looking and observing the, ob the, uh, the interactions between the, the surgeon and the patients, what kind of relationship do they have, what kind of language are they using, um, looking at the systems that are in place, uh, so this was put in place to, I don't know, let people know different information, but uh, not very effective. People are running in and out of rooms, not remembering to change this stuff. So that's why that one woman was sit, uh, standing outside the door, because the, the information was wrong. Uh, working with the staff as well to uh, understand their context. Here we were mapping... Uh, who they interact with uh, throughout their day. It was, um, we had them visualize it. Uh, it was interesting because none of them put the patient on there. They spent so much time thinking about like where they needed to go and who they were serving that they forgot that they're actually there for the patient, which shocked them. Um, looking at the environment that they're in, all the paper, the data, the materials that they're using, and following the experience all the way through to understand every aspect of what the patient and the doctor and the nurses go through. And then we use that information uh, to then go into the definition phase. So like, what 
did we learn? Uh, what insights, what patterns? And you can see here, hey, we're using Post-it notes because they're very helpful for moving information around, for organizing, for making things tangible so that a team can understand what it is they're trying to do together. We took a lot of photos. We used those as well to understand um, uh, and to remember what we saw. We created a journey map. This is a very high-level journey map of uh, the patient experience. We thought this was helpful for us because when we first were approached with this, we didn't know anything about people who uh, had brain tumors or brain problems. Uh, we didn't know what that experience was like. Going into that uh, room for a day doesn't really tell you about the 10-year journey that they might be on from when they first discover that they have an issue to many, many years later when they're still going in for follow-up. So we, when, to answer this question, how do you improve the patient experience? Well, geez, this is pretty big. Where? When? Created a service blueprint. So this is another tool that service designers use uh, that is organized by what's happening up in the, the front stage, the things that they, uh, in this case, the patient can see and the different touch points they interact with. And then what's going on in the back? What are all the things that the nurses, the doctors, the systems, the processes are doing to support that experience? Uh, I'm not very proud of this. This is the first service blueprint I ever created. It's not pretty. Um, it's a bit messy and, and difficult to understand, but I leave it up here because I think sometimes we should acknowledge that not everything we do is great and we can improve. Uh, we use this information to start generating ideas, so getting into the design phase after we had a good understanding of where we could make some um, impact. Uh, so here you see some very uh, high fidelity sketches and renderings by really good artists. Uh, no, obviously not. Um, I'm a very strong believer in uh, drawing being, one of, being the first uh, tool that a designer uses. I really resonated with, the, uh, with Aaron's uh, talk yesterday, where he does everything uh, in sketching before he goes into, um, into digital. Uh, you don't have to be an artist to, to sketch and communicate ideas. Uh, you just have to do it, and this picture proves that. Uh, we also created tools to engage with the patients to help them express the type of experience uh, that they wanted. And we developed storyboards that brought different ideas together over time and uh, helped us connect uh, in ways that if we were building it, it would, it would be too costly or it would be difficult. So storyboards are great for showing things that happen over time, for showing emotion, uh, for showing how different touch points connect. And then, of course, these are great because you can get quick feedback. We brought these in, obviously, to uh, the, the patient rooms to see how do you react to this and uh, use that information to further develop our ideas. So that was generally the process we went through to then get into, like, okay, well, so what, what are we going to do? Uh, what are we going to make? What are we going to deliver? to answer this question. So one of the things we suggested was that they reorganize the chairs. Uh, we, we thought, hey, um, it's very cramped. There's a lot of people with wheelchairs. Uh, many of them had to sit in the, uh, in the hallway, which, I mean, if you think this is beautiful design, the hallway is even better. Uh, no, very, very dehumanizing to, to be put in a hallway, uh, uh, I think, particularly in a, in a medical facility, because they're not really designed for people to hang out in. And uh, so we were like, can we change the chairs to make some more room? Which was, crazily enough, uh, immediately with, followed with, like, no, no, wait, you can't do that. Um, it's like, wait, this is no technology, this is going to take no time, we'll come in, we'll do it. Uh, we'll put things back, and still there was some resistance. So uh, whatever big idea you have to change your organization, just remember this story. 
Uh, but we did, we, you know, not, not super crazy, but we were able to like, change the space a little bit to provide some more room. So that's a solution. Another one is we redesigned the, uh, the information pamphlets that they had in the, the, uh, in the clinic itself to be more in the voice of the, the surgeon, to communicate some of the messages, to give you a sense of what the experience was going to be like. Um, the, the existing ones looked more like, you know, mar what, there was no difference between what you would see there and like a brochure for going on a camping trip, you know, outside of Quebec somewhere. Uh, not very personalized, not very much related to the experience. And then on a much bigger scale, uh, suggesting a, a whole new uh, system of uh, interactions that allowed patients to communicate in different ways when they're in the clinic, when they're outside the clinic, um, and again, using all this information. So the reason I show the, these things, and, the, and one of the key differences, I think, between this type of work and some other type of design work that you might do, is in product design, if you're approached with a project where it's like, we're going to redesign, or we're going to iterate on uh, this feature or, um, for an iPad or website or what have you, and you go through your double diamond process, the expectation is, at the end, you're going to have that thing. So if you learn anything along the way that says, like, well, this isn't the best thing we should be doing, the expectation is still, like, no, you're making that. What I love about service design is if you have a big enough and open enough question, like how do you improve X experience without associating a particular touch point to it, then there's lots of different answers that you can use to address that problem. And they can be low tech, they can be high tech, they can be obviously a mix of that. All right, so let me talk about how you think about design, then, if you are a service designer. Uh, first of all, services. What the heck are those? Well, they're everywhere. We interact with them all the time. They're integrated into our world. Uh, I love this definition from The Economist, of all places. Products of economic activity that you can't drop on your foot. So this is a product, not a service. Uh, what I'm doing right now, what this conference is doing as a service, uh, you, can, you can maybe pick me up and drop you on your foot, but I don't know if that's, that's good. Um, so you can't, it's not very easy to grasp. And then ranging from hairdressing to websites. So hairdressing could involve no technology, well, scissors is technology, I guess. Um, just two people interacting with some scissors, that's hairdressing, right? Uh, maybe a chair, to websites that, have, that comp could have no people, it's all technology, you're not, not interacting, and there's a lot of things in between that. So, a lot of different ways that services are expressed. The way I like to think about what service design means is that we're taking design and the things we've learned about design in the past few decades and applying them to that spectrum. So beyond the product, into the service sphere. And we're, all we're doing is we're taking methods of design and the craft of design, and we're applying it in areas that it hasn't been very deliberately applied in the past. And the, the key interactions of that are defining what it should be, that being the experience, and then orchestrating and making sure that it is actually executed like that. Executed in the way that you think you want it to be, and orchestrating all these different elements. Another way to think about that is if you got UX or user experience, uh, typically that means a digital interaction. Typically that's uh, a singular touch point. We can argue about this later if you want, uh, but for the sake of argument and moving this along, that is, you know, if you have a UX team, probably doing digital things in your, in your uh, company. Uh, service experience, again, looking at the, the ecosystem, looking at how all the different pieces and parts are orchestrated for a particular experience. Another way I like to think about it is when you talk about customer experience, 
Yes, you got the customer, you got the various interactions that the customer goes through in their journey. And of course, you want to understand that and design for that. But you also have the people that are interacting with the customer in a lot of cases, or maybe behind the scenes. And all the tools, products, processes, the structure of the organization, the culture of organization, all these things trickle, make their way into the customer experience. If you have a culture that's not customer experience focused, if you have structures that are highly siloed, the customers feel that. All the domain of service design. So with that, when you think about developing empathy, we talk about that a lot in design, you know, empathize with your users, empathize with your customers. Well, it's not just the customer. Yes, of course, understanding them, you should go do that. In a lot of cases, that's easier than understanding your business and making that change. But make sure you're empathizing with the people who are delivering the service, the people who are in the company as well, and the business. What are they trying to accomplish? What are their needs? Uh, hopefully, you're doing that anyway. That's a good, good design thing to do. In terms of process, might look something like this in terms of you know, de deconstructing it with the tools. So just to visualize what we saw a little bit earlier, doing some research to develop a journey, one of the fundamental tools of service design, in order to generate ideas or make decisions to create a new solution or a vision in order to design or orchestrate all those things using a blueprint and then ultimately making something. Journey maps, anybody make a journey map? Familiar with this stuff? Not surprising. Becoming much more ubiquitous uh, in marketing, in even general product design. People are re recognizing that it's important to understand the context of before, after, during, uh, and where you plug in. So years ago, this, a, a search would not have revealed that much. Today, they're everywhere. They look at all different ways. Um, I like to think about this kind of structure for the journey. You've got the overall experience that breaks down into stages, that breaks down into key moments and features and touch points and requirements. One of the problems that I see often is that people start here and hope that all the little things that are going on down here result in something magical up there. I don't see that being successful often. All right, little, little quiz in the middle here. So we got experience one. That uh, doesn't matter what it is, but uh, somebody goes through the experience, and this is how we map that in a journey. This being the baseline, this is positive, this is negative. We've got experience two. Looks something a little bit like this. So the question is, which experience is better? And the answer, according to Daniel Kahneman, is the orange one, uh, because it has the higher peak. And he has um, uh, a heuristic called peak end rule that's very important and relevant to service design and journeys, where the, the things that people remember, we're not, we don't have perfect memory, so we don't remember everything that happens. Remember the, the peaks, and those can be high or those can be low. So if something really terrible happened, you remember that. Uh, but if something bad happens and then something amazing happens, you might forget that that bad thing happened. And then you remember the, the end. So uh, in this case, I made the ends the same. So there's no, no, no uh, question there. But here, we got the higher peak. So it, when we're designing across experiences like this, it's important to know that you're not trying to make everything awesome. Because everything awesome would be like watching a horror movie where like, someone gets stabbed every single minute. <laughs> right? You need a break. 
You need like something just mundane to happen and just like move the thing along, right? So sometimes things just need to work. Sometimes they need to be great. If they do suck, like fix them, obviously. Um, Chip Heath uh, wrote a number of books, but the one I love is The Power of Moments. Uh, this is from that book. The surprise about great experience, service experiences is that they are mostly forgettable and occasionally remarkable. Uh, so not to uh, put a downer on anything you're working on, but chances are it's something that will just be in the sea of all the things that happen. What's important here is to understand, like, what do you want to be rememberable or remarkable or what he calls in the book magical? What are the magical moments? And those might be the things to elevate, to make higher in your journey. Uh, these are my rules on creating a great experiences from the work that I've done and what I've seen basically disappoint people. Uh, if you set the wrong expectations, people get mad at you. If you don't follow through, people get mad at you. If you're not reducing your pain, people get mad at you. And if you don't have any wow, that's probably not great, but you shouldn't try to make everything awesome or have everything be equal. And then, again, in peak end rule, end strong. Do something really good at the end. Leave people with that memory. Principles you follow as a service designer. Human-centered, co-creative, sequencing of things or sequential information, making things visual, being holistic. So here, we're working. Uh, this is not part of Capital One. Many of these things aren't. Uh, this was an adaptive path. We were working with um, a caregiver and a patient um, and facilitating that interaction, being very human-centered in what they needed. Here, we're working with uh, people in the community who are developing services for mental health uh, of youth in the area. Working with executives and process engineers and people who are outside of the, the spectrum of what we often talk about in digital, the triad of engineering and product and design. But also co-creating with customers, as I showed you before, working with them to help develop solutions, organizing experiences into ways that are manageable and understandable, taking the complexity and making it something that people can understand. So this is the, the mental health journey and the opportunities along the way. Blueprinting, as I talked about before. Being visual. Uh, this is a service origami that was uh, created by Jess McMullen uh, that was inspired by, actually, Hitachi uh, design. They have a beautiful little kit if you ever could get your hands on it. And it's, of course, Japanese, very small, and unfolds. But Jess created a whole thing uh, online that you can download, but you need a laser cutter printer, which I don't have. So you can make your own. But making things visual, uh, storytelling, uh, bringing it to life in ways that people can understand, and make decisions and decide, is this something we want to do and invest in? Because often, if you're trying to orchestrate a lot of these things, it takes time, people, resources, different teams, different disciplines. Being holistic, looking at entire systems, ecosystems, not just the customer in the middle, but also like what are all the things around it? In this case, this was for a home energy project with Hitachi and looking at everything from uh, what's going on in the weather to what's going on in government to impact uh, the, the future, in this case it was the, the future of home energy services in 2020, which is next year, which is crazy. And also bringing that holistic uh, view to how you go about designing all the things. So uh, this is working with product and uh, operations to understand the roadmap and how these things play out over time. Each card represents a different project. So these are not features, these are projects. 
So I created that principle list based on the uh, list in This is Service Design Thinking, which was released in 2010. Uh, this is Service Design Doing came out in 2017, and I just wanted to show you the, the shift in some of those things. Uh, one of the, mostly I'm still aligned with this. I, I think the one thing that, that has changed uh, language-wise a bit is the iterative, but uh, if you're doing good design work, you're being iterative, so I'm not calling that out explicitly. Uh, but making it real, which again, if you're doing good design work, you're always trying to get your things out in the world. But as evidence of that, um, one of the projects we did at Adaptive pa or not Adaptive, at Capital One, that was service design based, evolved into our money coaching service, which is a in-person service we offer in our Capital One cafes, which are untraditional banks that we have throughout. Uh, the United States. Um, so uh, ultimately, the goal of this stuff, in case you think that a lot of it is process, is to get things out into the world and uh, change the experiences that exist out there. Speaking of how you see the world, with this point of view, as I think with most professions, uh, although design is particularly annoying because you start to see everything that's flawed in the world, um, so since we're surrounded by so many services, you start to see that as well. But I'm going to talk about uh, looking at the, the positive ones. Uh, this is the Citizen M Hotel. Has anyone ever stayed at a Citizen M? Cit Citizen M, I should say. No, yes, we're going to get back there. Uh, over here. Uh, they, there's, um, I think there's one in New York. There, there's a couple in Europe. That's where I got exposed to them. Very nicely designed, multifunctional space that can move very easily from like being uh, a study space to a dance club. It's pretty impressive. Um, but when you go to check in there, it's self check in. So it's not your traditional check in experience. Uh, so you can see they're asking you what you want to do. Uh, you've got your room key cards there, which you pick up and you activate once you select your room. So you actually get to see which room you're, you're selecting. There is somebody there kind of hanging out, so similar to the airport experience when you're checking in, like if you need help, there is somebody. But you can do it all yourself. When you go to the room and um, tag the, the door, when you, open, when you go inside, the lights are automatically uh, turned on, because who wants to walk into a dark room uh, that you've never been into before? Uh, it is small, because it's London in this case. Uh, so I'm not going to hold that against the room. Um, but uh, so then there's information that tells you about uh, what's going on in this place, uh, playfulness in the branding, uh, welcoming signs. So you know this is pretty amazing, given that like previously I was just downstairs selecting this room. Uh, what's amazing is the the technology worked. Right, because this doesn't seem that amazing. It's like, okay, yeah, you did this, and then you just displayed it over there. But uh, it requires some different systems maybe to talk to each other, and that's going to be pretty difficult. So that's pretty cool. Uh, they've got additional branding, design, a uh, very great book by Oscar Wilde, and uh, a tablet that lets you control most things in the room, from the blinds to the TV to... Uh, the lighting, uh, so they have one of those colored lights that are usually kind of adjacent to the shower, which is kind of interesting. Um, when we stayed there recently with my wife, she was in the shower, I was changing the lights. It was, it's, kind of, it's kind of fun. Um, but uh, so as a service designer, though, you look at all these things and you're like, okay, well, these are just you know random things that could happen and, and somebody could notice or see. Uh, but you start to put them together in a way that creates some structure that you could then like, do something with. So all those things are individual pieces, but you can bring them together and say, like, okay, how are we going to evolve the check-in experience? Or which ones of these moments do we want to be more magical than another? Some of the things you do as a service designer that uh, aren't just design process, so of course you're a designer, and as I've alluded to before, like storytelling is a big part of the, the craft and the skills. 
uh, but you're also facil facilitation. So bringing all these different people together to work on a holistic experience that ladders up to something involves facilitation, uh, whether that is just communication or, or workshop facilitation. Um, you are probably also doing some kind of transformation work because this type of work is not embedded into most of our services now. I love this model by a colleague of mine uh, working in the healthcare space uh, to just simply highlights the different activities that you could be doing to help transform your organization. Uh, I use it as a way to, to think about what we're doing in each of these categories. So like where are we training versus coaching versus developing tools versus doing the work to show how it should be done. Uh, you might be advocating, as I do a lot, for the need for this. And uh, I created this to help understand where you might be in your service design journey as an organization. Maybe you have none, which is fine. Uh, maybe you are the individual who is pushing for this stuff, or you're bringing in agencies. But ultimately, for this kind of work to get really embedded into the organization, it has to eventually be something that's also top-down. Orchestration, so across teams, again, most organizations are set up in silos. You can't like, create groups without creating silos, uh, so we just have to deal with it. But what we don't often see is an orchestration layer between the, the different groups and the silos. You just expect that, well, whoever's doing the, the research part of the journey, like, they're just doing their thing, and they should just do that as awesome as they can, and that's going to be great. But if it doesn't connect with something that's really key down in the payment area, like, that's a problem. So we need people who are looking at all that and identifying those issues and opportunities and eliminating redundancy and creating efficiency. You're also a connector. So... Service design work and strategy work, some people often ask me, like, what's the difference between those things? Um, they, they can overlap, but ultimately you are trying to get things out into the world and real and get feedback and change the experience. But a lot of the upfront work that we do doesn't connect really well to the imp implementation processes that we have. Like, how does service design connect to Agile? How does it connect to the things we're currently doing? Uh, so find, I don't think we actually have great tools or methods or ways to connect these things right now. I think that is a challenge for service design and other types of design uh, in order to make those bridges. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> I, thought I, I thought I fixed that. I, I apologize for the OCD people in the room. Um, <laughs> All right, so, uh, so coming back to the, uh, the framework that uh, was created in that article, if I put all this together and say, like, okay, so what does it, mean, what does it take to be a service designer? Uh, what do you focus on? Uh, you're focusing on orchestration of interactions across time. You're looking at the front stage experiences and the backstage. And you're trying to understand like, how everybody's needs are being met and how everyone gets value out of what you're designing. So how do you do that? Well, you're advocating for the customer, you're looking at the ecosystem, uh, you're working with different groups of people. And so, okay, what skills or abilities do you need? Uh, you need to be able to both work on framing the problem and execution, empathizing with all those people, working across disciplines, obviously, on a wide range of stakeholders, connecting dots and visualizing and simplifying complex experiences, systems, things uh, that are difficult for people to understand, creating stories, communicating what you want the experience to be so people can go towards that, and then finally, understanding and appreciating various forms of design. And I think this one is, is particularly important. There are lots of different people that, come, that are coming into the service design space. 
Some of them are from, from very traditional design backgrounds. Some of them have no design, but might be from operations or more of a business focus or technology. Uh, but that has to be part of the making as well, and that is part of design that, that comes together to create service experiences. So, but you need to appreciate all those things. It can't just be about the thing that you're good at designing and also understanding that you can't design everything. All right, so how do you get there? Well, you can read books. Books can only take you so far, obviously, but th there's more and more out there. Uh, I mentioned a couple of them already. Uh, service design thinking and doing are, are both great, although if you're going to choose between one or the other, I would get the doing book. Uh, it's just version 2.0 is better. Um, uh, and uh, two, I highly recommend, again, service design doing, but also orchestrating experiences. Uh, this was written by Chris Risden and Patrick Quattlebaum, uh, both of whom I worked with at Adaptive Path. Uh, it really captures how we approach projects, and it's, it's a very um, practical, like, how do you do something? Uh, particularly if you're doing workshops and things like that, there's a lot of, of templates and structures in there that you can just take and uh, iterate on yourself. Uh, learn the tools, whether you get them from the books or find them in other places. Uh, ServiceDesignTools.org is a good spot that has uh, some case studies and, and various methods that are, are used. Other great places for tools um, on service blueprinting. This was a, a guide that uh, we created at uh, Adapted Path and launched out to the world for free, uh, as well as uh, information on um, mapping journeys. Or you can rethink your life, right? Uh, you can go to school, maybe get a different job, try to get into service design. You can start doing it yourself, maybe, in your organization, uh, or at the very least, get involved with the, the community. Uh, all these things have pros and cons, and there's no right way to do it. So I leave that decision up to you. Um, but in terms of the community, uh, the Service Design Network, which, uh, like I said, I'm on the leadership team of, uh, is a global network very similar to IXTA or AIGA or anything that uh, you're, you're part of in that scale, uh, but has a great knowledge base. Actually, this is another great book, Designing the Invisible. It was just released uh, in the past month. There is a Canadian chapter of the Service Design Network, the way that we are organized. We have a global uh, organization, and then individual countries or cities have chapters that they can create. So there is one in Canada. You can look that up uh, and uh, connect with those folks. Uh, we also have a global conference that uh, changes place every year, but you may notice that this year, it's in Toronto, yeah, for those of you that can read. Uh, so uh, the 10th, 11th of October, uh, the can Canadian chapter is helping to host uh, that and uh, really looking forward to being uh, back in Canada later on this year. Hope to see some of you there. And if you're interested in speaking, the, uh, the call for speakers ends on the 15th. So you have a few more days to do that you know, once you've got inspired by this talk and go out and figure out how to present about service design based on what you've seen today. Um, so another question, a question I get with all this is like, okay, but like, how do I really become a service designer or how did you become a service designer? So I'm going to give you the 10 easy steps now that I've gone through all that to become a service designer. Uh, one, study engineering. Two, switch to writing poetry. <laughs> Three, get a job at McDonald's because that's what poetry gets you. <laughs> become a reporter and still make no money, but it's... It's not McDonald's. Uh, join a startup that, that fails, because most of them do. Uh, become a CSS expert. I don't know, seems relevant. Um, get a master's in design. That was very helpful for me. Uh, join Nokia Design, build a service design at Adaptive Path, and ultimately join a bank through acquisition. <laughs> 10 easy steps. Uh, I do believe you have to do them in this order. 
So, all right, fi a couple of final thoughts. Uh, my minute is running out here. Um, service design for me, like, as a designer, you are giving form to ideas, uh, you're giving form to products, but in service design, since it has no form, that is the job. How do you give form to something that has no form so that you can then design it and others can help design it? If we can't see that form, we don't necessarily understand the problems that exist within it and we can't fix it. And as you get up in the scale of design problems, uh, that becomes a problem for many reasons. All these things are great, but if the system is broken, corrupt, or flawed, these are probably not going to fix it. And as we're seeing more and more in the world, the, the systems that we create are causing a lot of problems if we haven't thought about what the implications are going to be when it all comes together. And what I say, like, we haven't really thought about how we're designing those systems. I strongly believe that we need design at higher levels of Zoom, service design being one of them, system is another, and I see service design as a way to just elevate design and bring it into more places where it can be more impactful to more people and really make impact on the world. I think you guys can get there, we can get there, uh, it's a journey. And I thank you for being on this one. Un gros merci, Jamin. On va passer maintenant à une période de questions-réponses. Est-ce qu'il y a des gens dans la salle qui auraient des questions à poser? Some people will ask you some questions. Euh, à main levée, euh, j'ai un micro que je peux te lancer. Je vais vous montrer un petit cours. Il faut vraiment parler dans le micro. Il faut vraiment se mettre la face dedans. C'est vraiment spécial. C'est comme ça. OK? Alors, est-ce que quelqu'un aurait une question à poser? Vous autres, vous maîtrisez tout du design après une conférence de ça. C'est ça? Ah oui, on a quelqu'un! On a quelqu'un? OK, OK, OK. Hey, faites passer ça par en arrière. Ah, j'ai... T'as-tu des mains? Oui. Excellent. C'est derrière toi. Il y a deux mains qui sont levées. Hop. Et vers la gauche. Yeah. C'est un toucher. OK. One, two. All right. Uh, how do you fight inertia? Like, you tried to move chairs around and people didn't want to. What, how do you convince organizations that what you want to do is the right way? Or at least it, you intend it to be right and it should go on? Yeah, so, um, the, uh, I won't be able to get to the, the model quick enough, but the, the one model that I showed that was circular, that had training, coaching, tools, and doing the work, that's really good. That works from more of a bottom-up way of, okay, you know, if you're doing it, you show how it can work, you develop the case study. Um, if you have tools, you're helping other people uh, get accessible to this type of work. Uh, and then, of course, the coaching and training exposes as well. But a lot of that still is pretty um, bottoms up. And, uh, um, but you, could use, you can use a lot of the output of that to have the conversations you need to influence uh, those at the top. At Capital One, we've been... Um, relatively successful in, in getting there to a degree, incorporating some of these tools into the way that we work uh, across the organization, journey maps and blueprints in particular, uh, really helping the people at least start to understand that we need to connect these things. Um, uh, but of course, yeah, there, there is resistance uh, in any organization that I've worked in before. And uh, part of that is understanding the people that you're interacting with and what they're worried about. And often they're worried about uh, their expertise being challenged because this is not something that they're familiar with uh, and they got to wherever they got to not doing this. So um, the, the more you can understand that that might be how they're feeling and how can you, you know, get around that it's not a threat 
but then also uh, create the the conditions and the the cases for um, uh, for buy-in, and uh, I mean, and that's a whole art into itself, uh, and sometimes individual. But ultimately, like I said, I believe that at some point, if you're really investing in this, you need the buy-in at the top. And some organizations already have that. Like if you saw Airbnb yesterday, like they have design-led founders, they've already got that buy-in. It's much more ubiquitous. And other organizations, we're we're just starting. Thank you. Yep. Est-ce que quelqu'un d'autre aurait une question à poser? Oui, on a une question ici. Oh, je ne vais pas le lancer, tu sais, il est à côté. <laughs> oh, sorry. Is there uh, any kind of bias when you do service design for your own organization? Is there any bias when bias? you... Like when you take a look at your own experiences, is there any bias? Is, is it better to sometimes to hire a, an external <laughs> consultant or... Do we see things uh, in a more positive way when we look at our own experiences in our own business? Like personally? When, when, uh, yeah. When I, uh, what, what would be your advice? Sorry? Is it, is it better to do your own service design internally or, or to hire a consultant? Oh, is it better to do a, a hire internally or do it internally or hire? Um, It depends, like most things. I think the, the challenges of the external hire is uh, that they might not totally get the, the culture of your organization and what it might take to see things through. And a lot of the, the work of service design may take years, honestly, to, to see uh, impact in the organization. Uh, when I was with Adaptive Path, we worked for an organization for three years uh, on service design work, and, uh, and that I think that worked really well, but when we pulled out, uh, you could see the organization start to go back. So I think if you really want to have um, organizational change, having people inside that are going to keep the pressure on, uh, who uh, will, will continue to move things forward, even if the agency has to leave, is important. Now, an, an agency has the advantage of probably moving faster, at least initially, and having an XI point of view and I'm hopefully expertise. Um, so that's the advantage of the agency, but uh, I think like long-term, uh, you know, having people inside who are doing that is, uh, is, is going to be helpful or at least complementary to the agency so that they have a connector. That might be a different way to think about like how you're connecting, you know, the high-level stuff to like get, actually getting it executed. Great, thanks. Uh, on a two other questions? Oui, on a des questions. Tu peux passer le cube à ta gauche. À toi ensuite. Hi. Ah, um, how do you convince an organization that they need a service designer? Like here in Quebec, nobody knows what even it is. So how do you convince them? How do you convince them? Uh, if they don't know... Uh, it, I was going to say that. That's, uh, it, it depends. Um, but increasingly, there, is, there are things you can point to. Um, I'd say uh, pointing them to customer experience and journey maps or tools that are coming out of service design are helpful, and there's a lot that are in, you know, whether it's Harvard Business Review or Business Week or et cetera, uh, about doing that kind of work. So at least getting them exposed to, like, this, this is a thing that's happening in the world, and then connecting uh, design and service design to that. Uh, or... You know, if you're just trying to kind of start things up yourself inside the organization, um, experiment with some of the tools and show people the value. I've had tremendous uh, luck in like facilitating a, a few hour workshop with people either for like a journey map or a blueprint that, uh, particularly blueprinting, like people, when you try to get them to map how their service works with different people, uh, invariably somebody will say, what, that's how it works? And it's like, and it's your organization. So there's a lot of power in helping them see that they don't see everything that, that goes on. And uh, so I think through a combination of trying to use the tools, pointing to examples outside in the world and say, this is what we have to do. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's a journey and, and a challenge to go from, from zero uh, to you know, having this integrated, but that's where most people are.
Hi. Uh, do you think uh, service design, understanding all the systems that go to the service can help designing products that are more fit to the customers exactly? And, you know, they are uh, customer experience in, in, you know, that are a kind of a service experience in certain companies that look the way the um, people interact with the customer on, on, at the end of the service line, but they are product designer that are designing the project that the customer will interact with. So do you think that service design helps bring those two groups of, of people together? Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, one of the, the complaints I've had as a designer and I hear a lot is that you're Again, you're, you're asked to design something that you don't necessarily believe in or you don't understand how it connects to something larger because somebody else had made a decision someplace else. So uh, definitely I see service design as a way to bring those uh, two together. Um, and you know, when doing the, the work, uh, including the, or you know, again, like having, having all the different disciplines represented including the digital product design, product managers, et cetera, in that will help ensure you're moving in a direction that is connected or that the information that you might have being very close to the customer is considered in the strategy. So it's definitely not a black box thing. It's, it's meant to be co-creative. It's meant to be very human-centered. Uh, so it's, it's, it should be close and include people who are in the front lines as well. And that will eliminate a lot of redundancy uh, or, um, uh, or just not things that are going to work because they, you know, people making decisions maybe don't have that point of view. Cool, thanks. Is it the adaptator part of your presentation? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> to, to convince uh, the executive and the person on the front line, the adaptator in between, it's you, right? The facilitator? Yeah, yeah. kind of. Cool. Uh, it's okay, so we there. Hi, okay. So there was one slide where you brought up like the, how you could move from journey map into requirements, yes. like the, the like a trickle yes. down. Yeah. Yep. Could you give an example how that could work, like in a sequential way of moving from that uh, requirements and like more technical requirements, more than just being the journey? Uh, so I mean, it, broadly, understanding the journey and breaking that down into stages. Um, and moments is, is typically you know, one part of the, the process that happens together. But once you have those things, you can then look at and map the different features of your service to that and, uh, or realize you don't have them and determine which touch points or channels need to be mapped to those features. What are you doing? And then like, okay, if you're going to be uh, advancing any of those, um, or if you have a backlog or whatever, like what are the requirements to, to do that? Uh, that that's typically the the flow of things. We use it in a definitely in a planning sense and um, and almost like a roadmap sense of like these are the things we want to do. Therefore, we need to be doing these types of things. It's not meant to replace you know, anything you might be doing that's like more in the weeds if you're, if you're doing like uh, tech or agile or scrum or things like that. But it's a way to at least high level go make, you know, help people see that the things they're working on, you know, when they are making these micro decisions that it has to ladder up. And if it doesn't, then why are you doing it? Yeah. Thank you. Good, thanks. Est-ce qu'on a une dernière question? Oh, on est bon. We're good. I think we're good. Thanks Thank a lot, Jamin. Thank you. Cool. Ayez une bonne matinée, alors. On fait attention, ne cours pas dans les corridors et autour de la piscine. <laughs> <laughs>